united with Christ. Meet local churches with open doors serving throughout the Border Valley community and sharing the truth and hope of God's love and salvation. A presentation of Life Christian Broadcasting Television. And now, United with Christ. Hi, I'm Bill Cobb, and I'm from the Church of St. Clement in downtown El Paso. And I am here for United in Christ, which is the Monday show at 11. And I'm delighted to be here because this is uh, actually the 30th today. This very day is the 30th anniversary of KSCE Christian TV. Can you believe that? This very day. So April 15th, 1989 was the very first day there was a broadcast by this TV station. Um, and I'd like to read a little bit about that. Uh, in 1989, KSCE TV Channel 38 was licensed by the U.S. FCC, Federal Communications something or other, to the Episcopal Church of St. Clement in El Paso. And by the way, that is my church. That's the church I serve, except we're no longer part of the Episcopal Church. Uh, we left the Episcopal Church in 2007, and we became part of the Anglican Church in North America. So, uh, but although it was started at St. Clement's, uh, it was soon transferred to the nonprofit local corporation, Channel 38 Christian Television, governed by a board of six trustees with the mandate to serve our entire tri-state region as a community. Christian Television Station. Honoring God, airing educational, instructive, wholesome, entertaining family programming in both English and Spanish languages and some Arabic. And so currently, uh, KSCE TV Channel 38 is the only interdenominational trilingual 24-hour Christian TV station in the southwest border area. Um, I'd like to read a, a, a short quote from whose house we are, which is a book about the history of the Church of St. Clement, but it has a quote from uh, Grace Rendall, the founder of this station, about that very first day. She said, that day began an incredible journey that, thank God, has not yet ended. When I first walked into the television station on Yandel Avenue, directly across from St. Clement's Parish School, I stood in a small reception room with a big desk that necessitated squeezing by to enter through a door into the next room that was filled with people and furniture. That was the studio, which led to an office with four desks. That was it. Except for the tiny carved out space for master control equipment, another tiny space that held a long shelf with four telephones and four people sitting and talking on the phones, and a tiny restroom with a giant mirror sitting on the back of the commode. All the equipment was ancient and very used, and when the station went off the air, as it frequently did, it was because somebody stepped on a cable and pulled a plug out of a wall. <laughs> Quickly, though, I realized that this was God's station, that he had named it Channel 38 Christian Television, so there would be no doubt that this station was his. My heart filled with joy and gratefulness for the privilege of serving him and the precious people of the El Paso, Las Cruces, and Ciudad Juarez areas through broadcasting. So, uh, happy birthday, Channel 38. Uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful day, 30 years. Uh, so, and you know what? Why don't we pray for Channel 38? That would be a good idea. So, let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the blessings, the blessings that have come through this TV station. Thank you for the many people who have met Jesus through the programming, through people preaching the gospel and teaching your word. Thank you for the many people who've grown in their walk with the Lord Jesus Christ uh, through the teaching on this radio station Thank or TV station. Thank you, Lord, for all the, the, the revelations that come to people as they hear your word broken open. Uh, by, by gifted preachers and teachers. Lord, thank you for people who've heard about the power of the Holy Spirit and have opened their hearts up to you, Lord, and to your power through this TV station. So, Father, we just praise you and thank you for 30 years. Thank you for grace. Thank you for all 
the people that have made this station what it is today. Lord, we ask your blessing going forward on this station. Lord, until you return, may this station hold forth your gospel in a powerful way and that lives may be transformed through your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, a little bit of a long prayer, but it expressed what was in my heart. Um, so today, well, actually, yesterday began Holy Week, Santa Semana. But you might ask, do any Protestants actually observe Holy Week? Isn't that just a Catholic thing? And the answer is, yes, there are Protestants that observe Holy Week. As a matter of fact, I'm one of them. Uh, and so uh, I, I just wanted to, uh, to, to talk a little bit about that. Uh, where did Holy Week come from? Well, it's very interesting that way, way, way back in the fourth century, a woman named Ageria made a pilgrimage to Jerusalem, the fourth century. And she wrote a letter back to her girlfriends about her experiences. We only have fragments of this letter, but it was a long letter and it had a lot of detail. And she described what she found when she went to Jerusalem in the fourth century. What did she find? Well, she found that Christians who lived there, uh, believers in the Lord Jesus Christ who lived there, that they, um, that they uh, would celebrate the events that happened in the Gospels in the places that they happened, on the day that they happened. They would go around and on, on, on the Sunday before Good Friday, they would actually celebrate Jesus riding into Jerusalem on a donkey, what we call a Palm Sunday because people laid palms and clothing before Jesus and the donkey and they walked over him. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, and then, the ne and then on, on, on Monday, Thursday or Holy Thursday, the day that Jesus celebrated the Passover with his disciples and had the Last Supper and said, uh, this is my body, this is my blood, uh, they would go and do that in the place that they believed that that had happened. And then on Good Friday, they would go to the place where they believed that the uh, crucifixion took place. And they would have a service there. And on Easter Day, they would also have... Uh, in, in the ancient uh, world, Easter Day was the greatest... Christmas. It was bigger than... Uh, observe Holy Week. Well, Lutherans and some Methodists and some Presbyterians and, of course, Catholics and Orthodox Christians do observe Holy Week. And for me, this is my favorite time of year. I love Holy Week and I love uh, the celebration that takes place on Easter Day, the day that Jesus rose from the dead. And, of course, Easter isn't just a day. Easter is a season, too. Uh, Jesus, we read rose from the dead and appeared to his disciples over 40 days, 40 days of appearances before he ascended to the Father. We read about that in Acts chapter 1 and where Jesus uh, said, I'm ascending to my Father, uh, but not too many days hence I will send the Holy Spirit. You will be clothed with power from on high and you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit and you will be my witnesses to the very ends of the earth in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the very ends of the earth, Galilee, etc. So <clears throat> Jesus said that on, on, on uh, the day of ascension, 40 days after he rose from the dead, and then 10 days later, we celebrate Pentecost. Uh, so I just want to look at some of these. That, what, what happened in Holy Week? Well, for a lot of churches, uh, yesterday was Palm Sunday. But things actually began uh, in the Gospels on, I would say the last week practically began on Saturday. What happened on Saturday? Well, Saturday, of course, is the Sabbath. And we read in chapter 12 that 
uh, of John's gospel that on that day, six days before the Passover, so that would have been Saturday, Passover begins on Friday evening, uh, that, that there was a big feast in Bethany where Lazarus was raised from the dead. There was a big supper and a lot of people came because they heard that Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead. And they, uh, they came and that is where Mary, the sister of Martha and the sister of Lazarus anointed Jesus with costly narb to show her love for him. And I'm also sure for her incredible gratitude of raising Lazarus from the dead and also as a way, Jesus said, of anointing her, of anointing him for his burial. You may recall that Jesus didn't. Uh, there wasn't time to anoint his body before he was put in a tomb. And it was only the next day, Easter day, that Mary Magdalene and the other women came to, to anoint his body. Uh, so Jesus said, she has done this to, as a preparation for my death. Very interesting prophecy. So uh, this was on Saturday and a lot of people began to believe that Jesus was the Messiah because of Lazarus' testimony. He raised me from the dead. I was, I was dead for four days and he raised me from the dead. And there were so many people that saw it. Think the word is really beginning to spread. And that's why on the very next day, on what we call Sunday, uh, that day when Jesus came into Jerusalem riding on a donkey, there were so many people there. There were so many people there because of Lazarus' testimony. And because of all the other people, all the other miracles that had happened. But by far, the raising of a man who was dead for four days was the greatest miracle Jesus ever did. And so they came to the party. And then the next day, they came to welcome Jesus into Jerusalem. And they said, um, uh, they said, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. They were pretty certain Jesus was going to be the Messiah. And, um, and so Jesus comes into Jerusalem. That's the day that we celebrate as Palm Sunday. And of course, not everyone was celebrating because in that week that we call Holy Week, Jesus uh, confronted the corruption of the Jewish leaders, the temple leaders, uh, the Pharisees and the scribes. He confronts them, as a matter of fact, in Matthew's gospel, there's a whole gospel where he uh, denounces them eight separate times. In chapter 23 of Matthew's gospels, Jesus said uh, to them, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. In other words, Jesus denounces the leadership of the Jewish nation, both the political and the religious leadership of the Jewish nation at that time. And so, and also, uh, so what happened? Uh, the next day after Jesus comes into Jerusalem, oh, and by the way, that's, they had already decided that Jesus had to die. And not only did Jesus have to die, Lazarus had to die too, because he's telling everyone that Jesus is the Messiah. So the day after Jesus comes into Jerusalem, we read in the three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, that Jesus went into the temple. Now, this is one of the discrepancies. John places this event closer to the beginning of Jesus' ministry. But Matthew, Mark, and Luke say that it happened the very next day after Jesus comes into Jerusalem. And so I'm going to go with that. He comes into Jerusalem. The very first thing he does is go into the temple and he overturns the tables of the money changers and uh, those who were, who were selling uh, animals to be sacrificed. And there's a whole story behind all that. Why did Jesus do that? Why did he make a whip and drive out the, 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 the animals? Well, very interesting. The place where this was happening wasn't actually outside the temple. It was in the temple. It was a place called the, the Court of the Gentiles. And Jesus said, my house will be called, a, my, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. And so what Jesus was saying is, you haven't left any room for the Gentiles. You just think it's for you here. 
you Jews. And so that is why Jesus drove them out, was because, uh, he, because it wasn't truly serving the, all the people that God loved. Um, so Jesus goes into the temple. Now, it's very interesting that, that this is prophesied by the prophet Malachi, who says that the Lord will come to his temple. The Lord will come to his temple. It was a sign of the Messiah that when he would appear, he would cleanse the temple. And that's what Jesus did symbolically the day after he came into Jerusalem on a donkey. Uh, <clears throat> so a lot of things happen in Holy Week. Oh, a lot of happens. In John's gospel, uh, we have several chapters where Jesus talks to his disciples about the Holy Spirit. In chapters um, uh, 14 through 17, Jesus talks about the coming of the Holy Spirit. He really hasn't talked about the Holy Spirit that much. I mean, here and there he's mentioned the Holy Spirit. But now he downloads on them all, everything that he has to say about the Holy Spirit to prepare them for when he's gone. He says, I'm going away but I'm still going to be with you through my spirit. So <clears throat> much of what we know about the Holy Spirit comes from these few chapters in John's gospel. It's, they're just beautiful. And his high priestly prayer in John chapter 17 is amazing because we really begin to understand the relationship between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. No, the doctrine of the Trinity was not invented in the fourth century by uh, the Emperor Constantine, or the Council of Nicaea, which took place in 325 A.D. No, it's right there in the Bible. And it comes from Jesus' own lips, where he talks about his relationship to the Father. He says, I and the Father are one. And how are they one? They're, th they're one through the Holy Spirit. So anyway, and then back in the Synoptic Gospels, for instance, in Matthew's Gospel, a lot takes place. Uh, in these few days before his death. Um, Jesus tells some of his uh, amazing parables, which were actually very confrontational to the uh, Jewish leaders. And they understood that he was telling these parables against them. He tells, uh, and they challenged his authority. They said, who gives you the authority to do this? Uh, it was driving them crazy because they were supposedly the religious leaders. And then here's this guy who's doing all these miracles and everyone's going after him. And, um, and so Jesus tells some of his, his, uh, most, important, uh, his most important parables in, in these, uh, these um, ensuing days. And he also talks about his second coming. He talks about his return. And there's a whole chapter in Matthew, it's chapter 24, in Mark, it's chapter 13, in Luke, it's chapter 21. There's a chapter in each of the Synoptic Gospels where Jesus talks about his return. Uh, and that's, I don't even have time to get into that. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> getting over, he talks about, for instance, I mentioned these impar Im very important parables. He talks, he shared the parable of the talents. He uh, he told the story of the, the sheep and the goats, uh, where he said, what you do to the least of these, my brothers, you do to me. What you do not do to the least of these, my brothers, you did not to me. Uh, it's a very important parable. Uh, so I want to I wanna jump over to uh, what we call Maundy Thursday in our church or Holy Thursday. That was the day that Jesus had Passover with his disciples. And what a poignant time that must have been because he knew what was going to happen. He knew that Judas was going to betray him. As a matter of fact, John, the youngest disciple, probably, uh, who called himself the beloved disciple, was leaning against Jesus' breast as they ate the Passover. And Jesus said, the one with whom I dip the bread is the one who will betray me. And it was shortly after that that Judas took off. He left, the, he left the Last Supper. But this was the celebration of the Jewish, uh, the Jewish uh, 
liberation from Egypt, the Exodus. And uh, the whole story is back in, in the book of Exodus. Very powerful story about how God delivered Israel from slavery in Egypt. And yet there are so many spiritual uh, echoes and ramifications for us as believers in Jesus Christ about how through the blood of the lamb, which was put on the door post, um, the angel of death passed over. And so Passover really is about freedom. And of course, the story goes that they, they went through the Red Sea and they came into the promised land. And spiritually, Jesus, through his blood, cleanses us from our sin and that's why when they were when jesus was breaking the bread at the passover he said this is my body which is given for you they had no idea what he was talking about he was talking about his death the next day on the cross he said this is my blood the the wine this is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. And then he said, I won't drink this again until I'm in the, in the kingdom. And, and so at the great marriage feast of the Lamb, we're going to have such a wonderful, wonderful feast when we're all with the Lord in his kingdom. And it's, it's described in, in the book of Revelation, the apocalypse of St. John. And it, it tells us about how there will be a great marriage feast and we are the bride of Christ. We will be joined to the Lord for all eternity. So that is what happened. And it was there that Jesus got on his knees and washed his disciples' feet and said, today I'm giving you a new commandment. You've heard the commandment, love God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. You've heard the commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. Now I'm giving you a new commandment. The new commandment is love one another as I have loved you. And when you think about it, that's a lot more than just loving your neighbor as yourself. Loving your neighbor as yourself is kind of uh, makes sense. Uh, you know, I want to be treated the way you treat or I, I want to be treated. I want to treat you the way you I want you to treat me. Uh, but to love one another as I have loved you. Well, how did Jesus show his love? He died for us. He died on a cross. He suffered for us. And so he says, let your love for one another, those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're a family, not biologically, but spiritually, through the Holy Spirit, you're a family. Love one another as I have loved you. In other words, be willing to lay down your lives for one another. Jesus said... Greater love has no man than this, than he lay down his life for his friends. He said, I no longer call you, uh, or I don't call you uh, servants. I call you friends because I'm laying my life down for you. They had no idea what he was talking about. But they would very soon, very soon they would understand the very next day. As a matter of fact, that very night after um, they... Uh, had the Passover meal, Jesus went out into the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. And here we really see Jesus' humanity. Jesus was the Son of God. He was born of the Holy Spirit through the Virgin Mary. He didn't have a human father. He was divine. But at the same time, he was fully human because Mary was a human being and she was his mother. And it was through her body, through her womb, that he was born like everyone else, is born. He didn't just descend from heaven. He was born and he grew up um, as, a, as, a, as a man. And um, uh, we read in, 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 in Luke's gospel that Jesus, when he was a young man, he increased in, in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. He developed as a human being. So Jesus' humanity is really on display in the Garden of Gethsemane. What a dark time that must have been because he knew he was going to have to go through the cross. And I don't think it was that Jesus was afraid of death. Not at all. There are a lot of people who aren't afraid of death. I don't think Jesus was afraid of death at all. But it's as though he was absorbing into himself all the sins of the world so that when he was actually crucified on the cross, it was the sin of the world 
that was put to death. Wow, heavy, heavy, heavy stuff. So Jesus said, Father, if it's possible, let, your cru- let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, he knew the answer. This cup could not, this cup of suffering could not pass from him. He knew the answer. He said, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will. In other words, we learn that Jesus didn't really want to go through the cross, not in his humanity, but he wanted to please the father and he knew it was the only way. And so that very night, Jesus was arrested and we read horrible things happened between that evening and the next day at noon when Jesus was put on a cross. He was paraded around. He was taken to see um, Pilate. He was taken to see Herod. He was taken to see um, uh, the high priest Caiaphas. A crown of thorns was put upon him, a robe. He was beaten with a stick. A blindfold was put on him. They said, prophesy, tell us who hit you. Jesus endured. It wasn't just the cross. He endured the 39 lashes, which was enough to rip the skin right off your back. If you've ever seen the the movie, The Passion of the Christ, it's, it's hard to watch, but it's so realistic. Jesus was practically dead, and then he had to carry his cross up to the place where they crucified him. And he said, he, he said seven things while he's on the cross. I don't have time to go through them all. But Jesus, uh, you know, he forgave the man who was being crucified next to him who said, remember me when I come into your kingdom. Um, he, he said to Mary, to, to John, this is your mother, this is your son. Uh, he, 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 he cried out, The words of Psalm 22, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The reason that the father had to abandon his son was because he was taking our sin upon himself. And it was only for a moment. It was only for a moment because at the very end, Jesus gave up his spirit and he said, it is finished. Your sin and my sin was paid for at that instant in time. The sin of the world was paid for at that instant in time. So I want to just thank the Lord. Father, thank you that Jesus' death upon the cross was our victory over sin, over death, and over the devil, and that we have been given eternal life through our faith in him, the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.